From Eyewitness News, this is Newsmakers. With just weeks to election day, the race to be the next Rhode Island governor comes down to how well each candidate can woo the independent vote. Our exclusive Eyewitness News Providence Journal poll asked 500 likely voters who they would vote for in the governor's race if the election were held today. 42% said Democrat Gina Raimondo, 36% Republican Alan Fung, 8% went to moderate Robert Healy. Independents Leon Kayarian and Kate Fletcher each garnered less than a point. 12% aren't sure. Our data shows it's those who say they are independent that makes up the largest block of the undecided vote this week. On Newsmakers, our political roundtable goes in-depth on the governor's race and other key matchups in campaign 2014. Welcome to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White. Joining me this week on the political roundtable to my right, we have WPRI.com reporter Ted Nisi and from the Providence Journal, columnist Ed Fitzpatrick. And to my left, we welcome back political strategist Kara Cromwell and political analyst and pollster Joe Fleming. Good morning, everybody. Thanks morning. for joining morning, us on Jim. the program. Thanks for having me. Let's have some fun. Um, <laughs> all right, let's focus on the governor's race for the first half here. I'm going to go around the table. Uh, on the governor's race, your takeaway in a headline from the poll numbers we had here today, Ted. It's close, but Healy hurts. Three-way race, again, helping Ramondo. The not sure voters for governor, how two-thirds of them are independent voters in the state of Rhode Island. You would be a terrible newspaper headline writer. <laughs> <laughs> Way too many characters. Oh. All right, Kara, what do you got? Uh, what will Healy mean? All right, let's start with the Healy conversation. I'm gonna, this is my favorite section of a political roundtable where I ask you um, all a question that can't accurately be answered. Um, <laughs> if Robert Healy were not in this race, would Alan Fung be in the lead? Joe, what do you think? I think the race would probably be close to being tied at this point. I think um, Healy is definitely hurting Alan Fung. Ted? I tend to agree. Alan Fung's own poll uh, that he released in early September, which did not include Healy, had the race tied at 42 percent. So uh, you, Raimondo hasn't changed, but Fung has in the public polls since then. And, and uh, Ed, you had said uh, that Gina Raimondo once again benefiting from a, a three-way race from a, a from a packed ticket, if you will. Does that mean you think that Alan Fung would be ahead? Yeah, I think Fung would be up. He, he's, uh, you know, he's, he's, he got 9%, Healy got 9% in the 1994 governor's race. He spent 35 bucks, $35.31 <laughs> to, to, <laughs> to get eight, and uh, that's already uh, above, above uh, Ken Black levels, so. What do you think, Kara? I, I agree with that. I think he might be, you know, up by one or two, only because it seems to be the I'm not with Gina vote that's heading towards, uh, Healy and not Fung. You know, another piece of evidence for that is just the fact that Bob Healy is running strongest with the same groups that are breaking mm -hmm. for Alan Fung. So Bob Healy is getting 10% of the male vote, which mm -hmm. is breaking uh, in favor of Alan Fung. Bob Healy is getting almost 12% of the union vote, which surprisingly is breaking for Alan Fung. So you have to think if those, if a lot of people who are shifting Fung's way, he could have picked up a number of those votes potentially mm -hmm. if Healy wasn't in this race. A positive sign, though, Joe, for Alan Fung when it comes to Robert Healy in my opinion, is uh, under the strength of support numbers. So both uh, Ramondo and yes. Fung, for the people that say yes. they're going to vote for them, right. they have about 61%. Correct. But Healy he support is soft. Healy support is soft. Only 46% said they're definitely going to vote for Robert Healy, which means if I'm Alan Fung, I'm thinking some of this Healy support, as it gets closer to the election and people feel Healy can't win, let me give Alan Fung the vote. He could lose votes, Healy, as we get closer to the election. It's possible if Alan Fung can give these people a reason to come over and vote for him. So this might be one of those things where people who said in our poll that they're going to vote for Robert Healy, they right. go, eh, maybe not. And when they as it gets walk closer, the, especially uh, if the people who do not like Gina Raimondo and they're saying, I don't want her as governor no matter what. So I'm going to vote, but I don't want to vote for a Republican. I'm going to vote for Robert Healy. And the end might say, well, yeah, but Healy can't win. So let me give it to somebody who could win. All right, Ted had and Nick, if we could bring up the union household numbers on the screen. Ted had brought up the union household vote, mm -hmm. and it isn't often that you see a Republican beating a Democrat in union households. But here we go. When you look at the numbers, uh, we have Alan Fung winning by 42 percent. Again, this is union households. Gina Raimondo, 30 percent and 12% uh, for Robert Healy, which is interesting because uh, that's even higher than he got in the top line of vote. More union households have made up their mind for the governor's race than overall in Rhode Island. The undecided there is 10%. Uh, All right, no shock. Public sector unions don't like Gina Raimondo that much. Um, you have to think she's pulling some numbers from private 
right. private sector uh, unions mm -hmm. here. But again, is Robert Healy the union alternative um, in this race? Is, is he the one where if you just can't vote for Gina Raimondo and you have trouble voting for the Republican, you're going to go with Robert Healy? I think you're seeing that absolutely right now. I think you have a situation where there's a lot of union members who are public sector union members, not the private sector, who are saying, I cannot vote for Gina for what has happened with the pension system. But I'm really a Democrat, and I can't vote for Alan Fung. So I have an alternative, which is Robert Healy. If Robert Healy wasn't there, they might bite their tongue and vote for Alan Fung. But right now, Healy is benefiting by this. There's no question about yeah, that. Ted, Ted but we're 42% for a, a candidate that said in our debate that he's a right-to-work guy. Yeah, no, I think uh, I think I think the difference is Alan Fung has never uh, has not passed right to work, while Gina Raimondo has passed and pushed through the pension law that cu that cut benefits. There's a much stronger reason, people, and frankly, the General Assembly is never going to pass right to work. It's not right. really a live. Uh, Raimondo would would to me as a union member potentially look more threatening in the sense that she has shown she can pass things that people thought probably weren't going to get passed by that General Assembly. Ellen Fung's not going to walk up there and tell Nick Mattiello and Teresa Pivoui to make Rhode Island right to work and it's going to happen. Ed. Yeah, Mitt Romney was at the Bill Moore yesterday for Fung and he was saying, mm -hmm. they, we asked him about the right to work and, and he was saying, well, that, you know, I never thought that was going to happen in Massachusetts and I don't think anybody realistically expects it's going to happen in Rhode Island. So, yeah, there might be more Stay, stay on Mitt Romney for a second. It just it sort of struck me as interesting that um, that you had Alan Fung hammering Gina Raimondo in the ads over at 38 Studios, but also Wall Street. And then you have Mitt Romney coming in to support Alan Fung. Yeah, Fung's, He's kind of Wall Street. Yeah, Fung's run the ads uh, saying that uh, Raimondo's being bankrolled by Wall Street. Um, and But then he had uh, the head of Bain Capital standing next to him, who right. got uh, three to one more money than Obama in the last presidential election from Wall Street. So, yeah, an interesting dynamic there. Not to mention Don Kachiri reportedly at that fundraiser, of course, he didn't come out for the public availability after. Oh, okay. Well, again, the 38th But studio. again, Mitt Romney's here to raise money and build up support among Republicans, not the independents, not the Democrats. That's not going to happen in Rhode Island. He got killed in Rhode Island by Obama. So, I mean, he's here just to raise the money, not to get a strong message out there to vote for Alan Fung, but help him raise money. Yeah, Romney said, I don't think endorsements matter that They're much. Absolutely right. correct. Yeah. I was just going to say back on, on the Healy factors, I'm not sure we really know where he stands on some of these issues. I mean, I haven't seen a long, in-depth discussion with him on right to work. As far as I know, he's kind of a libertarian type, right? Right, yeah. yes. So um, I think your debate will be really important to see. Nice tease, Gary. Tuesday night, <laughs> Tuesday night, 7 p.m. I think it's going to be really important to drill down on those issues. And then, you know, I'd love to see another poll, or at least some tracking <laughs> polls, to see what happens after that. Does that move those Healy voters someplace? Does that, you know, pull some folks off of um, Fong or Raimondo? Now, in, someone had brought up uh, fundraising and in terms of fundraising, Alan Fung is way up. Ted, you reported on this in the last filings anyway. Uh, 910000 to yep. 333000 for uh, Gina Raimondo. So I'm sure she's out. She's proven that she can fundraise. But in many ways, it's not about the inv individual campaign account. We're going to see some independent expenditures. We're going to see. We already have seen that. Isn't that? A, <laughs> yeah, I mean, we're in factor? really, this is the first, uh, re really the first governor's race since all the changes that have happened in campaign finance in America came about. And I think we're going to see how that I makes it harder to tell where the candidates stand financially because in this case, we can look at just Gina Raimondo and Alan Funk's campaign account and say, oh, Gina Raimondo's at a disadvantage. But she has a super PAC that just got two checks that were were $150,000 from John Arnold and another uh, Texas Energy executive. So, you know, if they can keep raising money and attacking Alan Fung, which is what they've been doing, there's plenty more money behind Gina Raimondo than what we see in her campaign account. We've also heard Mike Bloomberg coming in, and then we're waiting, waiting to see if the Republican and Democratic Governors Associations come in to help them, too. So there's a lot of outside players who haven't shown their cards yet, and I think that will have a big impact. And we should note, Joe, that when we were in the field yep. for this poll, it was sort of a tough week uh, for Gina Raimondo yes, in terms of Alan Fung has, was up with some pretty aggressive uh, negative campaigns mm -hmm. on her, talking about uh, 38 studios, right. and we, we immediately saw her response. She came on with what looked to me a, a pretty rapidly put together ad to mm -hmm. respond to that attack, so yep. obviously they were concerned about it. Uh, and she had some, um, some headlines that, uh, about comments she made over partial birth, birth abortion. abortion. So do you think we're seeing a reflection in the numbers there? I think it's possible. I mean, Ted made a good point earlier off the air that simply she's had a bad couple of weeks. And in spite of that, she's still ahead in the polls. Mm -hmm. And the Raimondo campaign, they react very fast, rapid response. I mean, 
Funk started the 38th studio. I'm sure they were doing tracking, polling, and they found out it was starting to have some headway. They responded to it quickly before it getting the head of steam and try to stop that in its tracks. I mean, we may have seen a point where Gina has stopped the negative going towards it, but again, all three public polls have had Gina at 41, 42%. Her, her, she's been very constant, whether it's been negative ads at her or positive ads, she hasn't really moved in the polling yet. All right, I'm going to want to get to Alan Fung's favorability rating, uh, uh, but before we do that, uh, I'm curious, Kara, do you think that in a funny way, Buddy Sancy helps Gina Raimondo in terms of uh, interest in the Providence mayoral race and then boosting turnout in Providence? Sure. No, I think uh, definitely, because it'll, any increase in Democratic votes in Providence will help her. Um, she needs to do well in the urban centers, and I think that will definitely um, impact that. Although, you know, we've t discussed, too, there's going to be ticket splitting in Providence th where there may not have been ticket splitting before. Mm. So Buddy may give it, but Buddy may take the way. <laughs> <laughs> as ever. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Alan I Funk's, didn't say that. Uh, as promised, <laughs> Alan Funk's favorability numbers here. Um, and I've said this before, if Rhode Island were a high school, he'd be one of the popular kids. 64% favorability <laughs> rating, 20% unfavorable. 16% aren't sure. More good news here for Alan Fung, not on the screen, but we can tell you 71% of those who aren't sure who they're going to vote for in the governor's race have a favorable opinion of him. Compare that to Gina Raimondo's 49% of undecideds have a favorable opinion of her. Is that worrisome for her uh, at all? Yeah, I think uh, that's different. Uh, Joe pointed out right when we got these poll results back, that's different from what we saw. This is, of course, her overall favorable rating, 58% there, which isn't bad. But as you're saying, if you look deeper into the guts of the poll at how the undecided voters feel, you see a, what, a more than 20-point gap between yeah. Alan Fung and Gina Raimondo among those undecided voters. That's not what we saw. One way we all started to feel Clay Pell couldn't close the deal in the Democratic primary mm -hmm. was that when you looked at undecided voters, they had a pretty negative opinion of him. So there was little reason to think they would mm -hmm. break and support him when they finally made up their minds. Alan Fung right now is in a stronger position with them, but I will say Gina Raimondo's not, Clay Pell, I want to say, was down in the 20s yes, with those undecided voters. She's right. nearly 50%. She certainly can make a case to a lot of them. And as uh, Angel Tavares has shown, uh, favorability numbers don't always no, translate. It doesn't always translate, but we're talking about the undecided voters. And 70% of them have a favorable opinion of Alan Fung. If I'm Alan Fung, I'm going to take that and I'm going to run with that. Yeah. That this tells me there's a chance to grab these undecided voters. He has to grab a lot of them, but it says there's a chance. And Rhode Island does have a history of supporting Republicans for governor. So I would be encouraged. I think there's also an opportunity here for both camps to decide what the last two weeks are going to be about. And I think um, nationally we've got some you know, pretty heavy stories in the news, Ebola, ISIS, and these other things that are kind of weighing us all down. And I think if you have a candidate that comes out that does a ton of retail in the last few weeks and has a very hopeful message, I think that's the candidate that wins, whether you know, it, it you know, increases Gina's favorability because people get to meet her and see that she is energetic and hopeful, or you know, if Alan's able to put up a lot of TV that shows him as being that likable guy. I think there's a, there's a tone that needs to be changed right now for both candidates. What Alan Fung is up against right now that uh, has to be something that's top of mind for his folks is that you know we've seen repeatedly in recent years undecided seem to break toward the Democrat. Even I think of David Cicilline's campaign. People thought he was so damaged. No undecided voters going to David Cicilline and he won by 12 points. Right. So while uh, you know I know some people have said well perhaps this shows a ceiling for Gina Raimondo. She can't get past 42 percent. I remember hearing that a lot about David Cicilline and it was just not the case. So I think it's it's hard to tell where Rhode Island voters are going to go. Yeah, but didn't they, I mean David Cicilline had Barack Obama at the top of the ticket? Which, like, which sure, but that helped. but they were undecided. These were voters who were already saying they were with and, Barack Obama. And I think the other thing is is that in the statewide governor's races, the undecideds and tell me Joe if I'm wrong here <laughs> seem to have broken for the Republicans. Yes. Um, you know, in a lot of these races, and it when so when you're talking about undecided, a lot of it depends on where they were. Um, and, you know, Though Don really Kachiri was up in our, in 2006, Don Kachiri was up in all of our polling uh, throughout that campaign. So there wasn't really so much a break toward him as he was at 50% in our last two Channel 12 polls. Right. In 2000, it was Charlie Fogarty. Yeah, right? yes. but, uh, and everyone, that got tight. But yeah, it did tighten up. But everyone thought Kachiri was going to win very easily. So the undecided started to go that way. When you're an incumbent, the undecideds tend to go against you yeah. sometimes. But in 2002, when Don Kachiri first went against Merrick York, York had the lead in the early polls. Kachiri came out of the end. Yes. Four years 
years ago. Roe was high, was way down. The Republican came on at the end. So it is possible for the Republicans to get traction. But again, Gina has the money, I think, to try to negate that. I mean, O2, a seven, there was a 17-point swing away from Merth York to Donka Chair in our polling. So big shifts can happen. All right, I am way overdue to pay some <laughs> bills here. But uh, first, Ed, real quick, do you, I mean, do you think Gina Raimondo is thankful right now that the General Assembly waited until this election uh, to uh, eliminate, or after this election, to eliminate the master level? This will be the last election with straight ticket voting on it. Oh, yeah, that's going to help. I mean, yeah, there'll be some ticket splitting with Buddy, but... I, I think the mass love mm -hmm. is a huge, huge uh, assistance to her. All right, and we talked about this, the governor's race and the Providence mayoral race uh, suck the oxygen out of the room, but mm -hmm. there are other uh, <laughs> races on the ballot, and we pulled those uh, down ballot races as well. And when we come back, we're going to talk about those matchups. Stay with us. You're watching Newsmakers. Welcome back to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White. This week we are doing a political roundtable on our latest Eyewitness News Providence Journal poll. If you want to follow along at home, you can catch it online, WPRI.com. Joining me on the roundtable, Ted Nisi, Ed Fitzpatrick, Kara Cromwell, and uh, Joe Fleming. Let's talk about the down ballot races. We, the first half was dominated by the governor's race. Uh, and Ted, overall, you know, General Treasurer, Attorney General, Lieutenant Governor, Secretary of State, um, Overall, looking at these, what does this poll tell you about the down-ballot races? Uh, the Democratic Party remains very strong in Rhode Island. I mean, we have in this poll, higher up in the poll, 56% of voters saying the state's going in the wrong direction, only 24% saying it's going in the right direction. You see numbers like that, you might think the incumbent party would be in some deep trouble and people want a big shift. But in these down-ballot races, which haven't gotten a ton of attention, no. In every case, we have the Democrat reading in three out of four cases by double digits. That has to be somewhat disappointing to Republicans. I know... Uh, uh, it's true, Kara was saying uh, before we went on the air that, you know, the uh, there is a financial disadvantage, those candidates, and they haven't had primaries. But still, you, you don't see just the um, annoyance of the state of the state translating into support for the opposition party here. And, you know, uh, as he sort of touched on there, Joe, is this one of the examples where primaries help? Absolutely. Exposure high for the de Dan, Democratic Dan candidates? Dan was not a household name. Seth wasn't a household name. Nellie wasn't a household name. They spent money on TV in the primary. They got exposure. A lot of those people who they who saw their ads didn't vote in the primaries, but they know something about them. Catherine Taylor has not gone up or is just going up now with her ads. So she ran for Secretary of State four years ago, but she's people forget from four years. It's a long time. She has to get her ads up quick and really start to get her name out there. Well, Dan McKee's got his ads up already. Let's talk about the Attorney General's race. And, Kara, I'm going to go to you on this one after we show everyone at home the numbers. This is a 14-point spread in the race uh, between the incumbent Peter Kilmartin and uh, Republican Dawson Hod Hodgson, his challenger. Kilmartin, 46 percent of the vote. Hodgson, 32 percent. 20 percent uh, aren't sure. But, uh, Kara, Peter, Peter Kilmartin, although he should be encouraged, by uh, a 14-point lead. He's not over 50% here. Uh, what do you think? Is this pretty much a done deal? Is this uh, is there room for growth for Dawson Hodgson? What would you do if you were running <laughs> the Hodgson campaign? Oh, boy. <laughs> Put me on the hot seat here. I, I think, you know, it has to really go well for Dawson in these last few he weeks to, here. He has to he crush has to the undecided. Yeah, yeah, he has yeah. to run mm -hmm. the table. So um, I think, it, as you pointed out, would be concerning for Peter um, Kilmartin that he didn't get over 50 percent. But he's almost there, and there's not a third uh, candidate in the race. So I'm not going to say it's, you know, almost over, but it's, we're, you know, whatever, 17 days out, and I don't see a, a big break coming for him unless an outside expenditure comes in. Or, as we talked about before, it has to be a single issue thing that he can grab onto that, you know, um, Kilmartin's done very badly. A single issue. He, he had the issue. 38 Studio. I think the problem is, like Kara said, the resources. Did he have the money to get it out there? He's been advertising the 38 Studios thing on the radio. Does not reach enough people. He needed to get that up on TV. Up to this point, I don't remember seeing it on TV that much about 38 Studio. That's an issue. We've had attorney generals in the state that went down on one issue over the years. So people do vote for attorney general based on one issue if they're motivated enough. He has to motivate them over the next two and a half weeks if he wants to bring Peter Kilmartin down. Being under 50% is a sign that Peter could have a problem. But if Dawson does not get that message out there, he's not going to have a problem. And I think that would have been the issue. However, everybody had, there's all, a lot of blame to go around on that. Everybody, you know, from Kacheri to the General Assembly to Commerce RI or, 
EDC, as they mm -hmm. called it before, 38 Studios. So I think he could have grabbed it if he could have pointed it in the right direction. Well, that's just it. If you, if you grab it and you keep repeating it over and over, it starts to sink in. The and perception becomes reality. Exactly. So back to your question. If I'd been running the campaign, I guess I probably would have gone up early on Earlier. TV. Yeah. Early on 38 Studios nailed it right there and tried to keep after it. And that's the problem here, isn't it? I mean, uh, the as we get closer to Election Day, we're just about two weeks out, a little more, um, the governor's race is going to start uh, making a lot of noise. The uh, Providence mayoral race will make even more noise. I mean, should Dawson Hodgson have been up earlier, as Kara said, Ed, uh, to try and be ahead of it? It's just hard in this election cycle to gain any attention down ballot. You know, there's so much. I mean, everybody's coming in from out of town to write about Cianci. And, you know, uh, in, in the attorney general's race, I mean, last time it seemed like every attorney in the state was running. You know, we've got <laughs> a one on one this time, so there's an opportunity there. But your poll showed that Kim Martin's doing well with women, he's doing well with older voters. Mm -hmm. There's still an opportunity among independent voters, but yeah, it, it, it's 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 going to be hard to close a 14 percent. Let's uh, talk. Percent. Yeah. I'm sorry. Let's talk, Ted, about the lieutenant governor's race, and it's an interesting one, uh, relatively speaking, to the other down ballots because it's uh, the tightest spread we have, um, and there's a high undecided there. Cumberland Mayor, the Democrat Dan McKee, at 36 percent. Uh, Catherine Taylor, the Republican, 27 percent. Uh, moderate William Gilbert uh, and, and Libertarian Tony Jones, they bring in less than 5 percent, but 31 percent undecided. Uh, so, I mean, no idea how this, this race play is very out. interesting. Yeah, I did a story for WPRI.com this week about uh, looking at the 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 party alliances are all scrambled in this race. Mm -hmm. Catherine Taylor, the Republican, there with 27 percent, she has. All the union endorsements that have been getting out. Dan McKee, the Democrat, doesn't have a single union endorsement. Mainly that's because of his vocal advocacy for charter schools that turned off the teachers' unions and it spilled over. So you, uh, the AFL-CIO in Rhode Island hasn't endorsed a Republican since 1986, and they're backing <laughs> Catherine Taylor. Now, that said, he's a, Dan McKee is ahead in our poll. Again, not going to get a lot of attention. Uh, Dan McKee is going to be running on the Democratic ticket. The master lever will be there to help him and everything else. So, you know, it's it, it, in some ways it's still his to lose. But with the race this tight and so many people undecided and these X factors of her being a very moderate, John Chafee kind of Republican, I think she has a chance. But again, it's it's always an uphill battle if you're not the Democrat in Rhode keep, Island. Keep in mind, in the primary, Dan McKee was behind by about 12, 14 points to Ralph Miles. Huge undecided, we, I was going to say, 50% undecided. Right. So, and here we got a third of the voters undecided. You don't know what's going to happen with them. As Ted said, no one's focused on this race. Is this so, one you're going to be watching election night? Oh, absolutely. Night? Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, no. you watch all of them, but yeah. you understand some, them. <laughs> some people say this could be the year of the woman in Rhode Island. We got three women on the ballot. If so, uh, Catherine Taylor could benefit by this. You're kind of becoming the expert on the LG race. Did I see you were quoted in a national publication? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Why is there interest well, you know, nationally in this? Well, you know, because it's when you pair this one with the governor's race. I mean, you see here in Rhode Island what's happened over the last four years as there has been a real rupture in the Democratic Party over how to handle issues very important to the unions. Gina Raimondo made her name and is where she is now by reducing pension benefits or, uh, in, a, in a bill mm -hmm. that she says, you know, was thoughtful and Democratic, but still more than any other state has done, which now means she's lost one of the bases of support that a Democratic politician has. And you see the same thing in the LG's race with the GOP and the unions are yeah. aligning. Except what are we seeing right now, though? George Nee has come out and personally endorsed Gina Raimondo. President Bob, of the AFL-CIO. President of the afl -CIO. Bob Walsh from the NEA is now saying Gina. And you would think Bob Walsh would never say Gina. No. You no. know, but they're saying we'd rather have Gina than Alan Fung because he's right to work. So, I mean, they're coming around. But it is very strange right now, no question. Kara? I think the bottom line with all of the, the down ballot races is that there's a huge undecided, and most people don't pay any attention to them until they get into the voting booth, or if they see something on TV like, oh, yeah, she's running, or oh, he's running. I don't think people think, ooh, what am I going to do about lieutenant governor? Well, it's keeping me up at night. The <laughs> only race that we don't have a huge undecided uh, relative to uh, the other races, again, is general treasurer. Um, and I'm wondering if. Uh, you know, Seth Magaziner here should be sending Frank Caprio a, a thank you card for this. I mean, the, that race, uh, he really drew attention to Seth Magaziner. Half a million dollars. It really helps in the primary. Um, it really got Seth known. He got a message out there about the anti-corruption candidate. Uh, he could do the job as general treasurer. But I think we're seeing Ernie Almonte, though, do a nice job trying to say, I get the experience to do the job day one. And if Ernie can keep that, getting that message out there, that could help him greatly. I, I think the thing about Ernie, though, sadly, he's clearly not decisive. And if somebody's looking for a general treasurer who can make a decision, 
what party, well, what office. Why do you think he's not decisive? Because he because changed he parties? Because he changed parties. He changed what I'm running for. <laughs> I, I mean, you know, I almost feel badly for him because I hear that he's the nicest person in the world. However, you can't be running for governor and decide you're passionate about that as one party. Mm -hmm. And now he's supported by the Republicans. I just don't think he. Well, know, I also gets think I think what that. that may have done, Tony Almonte, is made it harder for him to get up ahead of spe steam against uh, a well-funded and and fairly savvy candidate, despite his youth in Seth Magazine. Ernie Almonte was not running as an independent mm -hmm. candidate for treasurer until the day of the filing deadline. He'd been in the Democratic primary, and before that, he'd been in the Democratic primary for governor a long time ago. So I think, you know, again, up the, all these candidates had uphill battles. They need a lot of things to break their way quickly. The thing to keep in mind about the down ballot races. When people don't know what's going on, they vote the normal political party. 40% mm -hmm. of the voters are Democrats, 10, 12% 10, are Republicans. All the Democrats have to do is run even with the independents, or close to even, and they win the down-ballot races. Uh, we got to wrap it up. As Kara uh, mentioned earlier in the show, we have a debate Tuesday night, 7 o'clock, at the Providence Performing Arts Center. The major candidates for governor go online. Ted and I appreciate it. We read all the questions. You can submit them at WPRI.com. For everyone sitting at this table, I'm Tim White. <laughs> See you next week. <laughs>